All right. Good evening. My name is Alana Cadell Tucky, and I'm the director of the Office of Environmental Justice at the Department of Environmental Conservation. I'm also the chair of the state's climate justice working group. Joining me this evening is Adriana Espinoza, the deputy commissioner for equity and justice here at DEC. Samir Ranaday and Tyler Picard are partners from the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Alex Dunn from Illum and other staff from DEC and ICERTA who are assisting us this evening. Thank you very much for joining us for this education session on the draft disadvantaged communities criteria. The climate justice working group worked over the last year and a half to develop the criteria for identifying disadvantaged communities to implement the climate leadership and community protection act. And they voted unanimously to release the draft criteria for public comment on December 13th, 2021. The public comment period commenced on March 9th of this year and will close on July uh, 7th, uh, 2022. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, just a statement on today's session. Uh, today's session is informational only. We will review the criteria now open for public comment and provide an overview of our process, but this is not a public hearing and no comments will be entered into the record. So just again, this is an opportunity for you all to review the Climate Justice Working Group process and to ask some technical questions. We will have an opportunity to ask questions after the presentation. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation and you are using the online WebEx, please use the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen. Although this is not a hearing, we, we absolutely want to hear your thoughts. So if you're interested in submitting comments to us on the draft criteria, we want you to visit our website uh, or submit them via email or send them through the U regular US mail. Uh, that address is attention draft DAC comments, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, attention office of environmental justice, 625 Broadway, 14th floor, Albany, New York, 12233. And we'll show this information again at the end of the presentation. So don't worry if you didn't get all of that right away. Uh, this uh, presentation is also uh, being interpreted in Spanish. And with all of that said, I am going to throw it to Samir Ranaday. Samir. Great. Thanks, Alana. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining this session. My name is Samir Wanade. I work as a climate justice advisor at the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. My job is to support the coordination, outreach, and implementation of New York's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, or Climate Act for short. Let me provide some background on this law. Passed in 2019, the Climate Act is the nation's most ambitious climate change related legislation. Its goal is to reduce New York State's greenhouse gas emissions from all human activities by 100% over 1990 levels by the year 2050, with an incremental target of at least a 40% reduction in greenhouse gases by the year 2030. At least 85% of the reductions by 2050 must come from preventing the release of greenhouse gases. The remaining 15% may come from carbon removal projects like conserving soil, growing forests, and restoring wetlands. To keep us on track to meet these goals, the Climate Act also sets targets to phase out the use of fossil fuels in electricity generation and to massively build out our offshore wind 
and distributed solar resources, increase our energy storage capacity, and become more energy efficient. Implementing the Climate Act will create opportunities to build a better future and to ensure this work also advances climate justice, the Climate Act mandates that at least between 35 to 40 percent of the benefits of New York State's spending on clean energy occur in disadvantaged communities. The identification and prioritization of disadvantaged communities in accounting for the benefits of cutting pollution and improving resilience is what makes our Climate Act a transformative law. Next slide, please. A large part of my job is to provide staff support for New York State's Climate Action Council and the Climate Justice Working Group. Both bodies were established by the Climate Act to carry out important functions. The Climate Action Council is working this year to finalize a scoping plan. It will provide a framework for how our state will achieve the ambitious greenhouse gas reduction and clean energy requirements and goals that I described on the previous slide. Public comments are being accepted on the draft scoping plan through June 10th, and there are hearings scheduled across the state. That topic is separate to the topic we'll be discussing today, but I encourage everyone to learn more about it and participate in that comment period. You can find information on the scheduled public hearings and how to submit comments at climate.ny.gov. Today's session will provide you with the background you need to comment on the draft criteria for disadvantaged communities that was developed by the Climate Justice Working Group. They will finalize the criteria after considering your comments. The working group consists of 13 members, four of whom represent the state agencies on the slide, and nine are from environmental justice organizations, evenly representing rural and both urban upstate and downstate areas using their experience and expertise, the working group developed draft criteria to guide the implementation of the scoping plan to help achieve climate justice. This is important for many reasons. Climate change will adversely impact everyone to a significant degree over time but not everyone will be impacted equally as these impacts unfold. Climate change is a threat multiplier, so it can exasperate existing vulnerabilities and inequality in communities that already face disadvantages due to foundational barriers such as poverty and the legacy of racial and ethnic discrimination. So, for these reasons, and because climate change is such a vast problem that affects our entire economy and society, it is imperative that our approach to solving climate change intentionally uplift communities facing systematic disadvantage, systemic disadvantages and those who will be most impacted by it. 
when we aim to create a high standard of living for everyone, everyone's standard of living improves. And now I'll throw it back to Alana to provide background on the language in the legislation that explains the purpose of the disadvantaged community criteria and provides guidance to the working group for how to create it. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. Uh, can we advance a slide? Yep, uh, one more. Thank you. So this slide shows the section of the Climate Act that outlines the basic definition of disadvantaged communities. As Samir stated, the effects of climate change affect all of us, but the harms are not equally distributed. Uh, disadvantaged communities bear a disproportionate burden of environmentally related harms, which can be measured in terms of factors like health, income, and life expectancy. Uh, the Climate Justice Working Group was guided by the language in this section in identifying disproportionately burdened communities using the data on environmental hazards, public health issues, geography, and socioeconomic factors like race, income, education levels, unemployment rates, and housing conditions to develop the draft criteria. The reason the law requires the considerations of these factors in identifying disadvantaged communities is because they have a direct correlation to disproportionate environmental burdens that exist due to historical and contemporary discrimination practices, such as redlining, which is a now outlawed practice where the federal government excluded black homeowners from accessing home loan programs that would have made it affordable to purchase a home in neighborhoods with higher property values and a healthy and healthier environment. To show how the effects of this practice continue to affect communities today, if you were to take a map of our state showing major air pollution sources or census tracts with the least amount of tree cover and lay it over another map of our state that showed communities that were previously redlined, you would see a near or complete match in most cases. Uh, this slide also shows the Climate Act requirements to establish the disadvantaged communities criteria. Uh, as you can see, the criteria is based on the geographic, public health, environmental hazards, and socioeconomic criteria. So it's included, but not limited to uh, areas burdened by cumulative environmental pollution, areas with a higher uh, uh, proportion of people who have rent unemployment, rent burden, and dis uh, discrimination, and areas that are vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Uh, you can see all of that there. And it's also very important to note that while the legislation served as an outline and a guide for how to identify disadvantaged communities, uh, what we're seeing throughout this presentation and what we've seen throughout the process, uh, specific draft deck indicators were driven by the working group. Uh, their lived personal experiences and the lived experiences of the communities that they serve. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this slide explains the purpose of the disadvantaged communities criteria, which will serve as the state implements the Climate Act. The state agencies are required to prioritize greenhouse gas emissions and co-pollutant reductions in disadvantaged communities. And this includes DEC in drafting regulations to meet the greenhouse gas emissions limits required by the Climate Act. Uh, many greenhouse gas emission sources, uh, such as vehicles, pipelines, and power plants and landfills and factories also produce co-pollutants that damage the health and the ecosystem of the areas where they're released or carried by the wind. Uh, there's also the accounting of investments, as you see on the other side. Uh, Disadvantaged communities criteria must guide the state's clean energy and energy efficiency investments. Uh, as you see, a minimum of 35% uh, with a goal of 40% of the benefits of clean energy and energy efficiency spending made by any state entity 
will need to be realized in disadvantaged communities. Uh, this requirement applies to all of our clean energy or energy efficiency investments related to the areas of housing, workforce development, pollution reduction, power generation, transportation, and energy related economic development. The benefits of those investments can include clean air, improved health, energy cost savings, and jobs. Uh, making sure these benefits accrue in disadvantaged communities is crucial because the communities that are disproportionately harmed by pollution and climate change are in this circumstance because they face barriers to accessing and owning clean energy services and technologies. Uh, for awareness, the state is currently working on a process for measuring tracking and reporting on clean energy and energy efficiency investments and associated benefits pursuant to the Climate Act requirements. Uh, next slide, please. So with all of that said, I would like to turn the presentation over to Alex Dunn from Alum, our amazing technical partners who labored through this process alongside of us. Alex. Thanks, Alana. Uh, I'll be reviewing the details of the draft criteria. And before we jump into the content, I'd like to review some of the terminology. So next slide, please. In the next set of slides that we'll be talking about, there are gonna be three main items uh, that we'll be using terms for. Components, factors, and indicators. Indicators are the individual data pieces, such as low birth weight or projected flooding risk used to make up the criteria. These are each combined into factors, the middle size box there, <clears throat> which are a group of indicators that all fit into one category, such as potential pollution exposures. These factors all fall into one of two buckets called components, either environmental burden and climate change risks or pollution or population characteristics and health vulnerabilities. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the development of the draft criteria included an assessment of more than 170 indicators. Those indicators were assessed using a number of factors, the availability of sufficient high quality granular data, correlations to the indicators, ideally showing some overlap, with other indicators, but not so high that it doesn't really add anything to the criteria. And then the applicability of the goals or to the goals or application of the CLCPA DAC definition. The Climate Justice Working Group determined <clears throat> that having fewer indicators and stronger ones in the criteria would be a simpler and more transparent option than a long list of indicators, because it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a stronger definition or that it contributes to the disadvantaged communities or DAC definition if you include them all. Next slide, please. <clears throat> As I stated before, the Climate Justice Working Group identified 45 indicators that met the intention of the three pillars outlined in the Climate Act. 20 of those indicators related to the environmental burdens and climate risks, and 25 related to the population characteristics and health vulnerabilities. The geographic DAC scoring approach used data from national and state sources. 45 indicators were grouped within their respective factors, and each factor represents a concept that is referenced within the Climate Act itself. Factors were then combined into their respective components as a step to produce the final score, which we will dive into in more detail in the coming slides. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Before we dive into how do we add it all up, here are some of the, the indicators within the factors. There are three factors within the environmental burden and climate change risk component score potential pollution exposures, which includes pollution indicators like traffic density and wastewater discharge, land use and facilities associated with historical discrimination or disinvestment, which includes data like remediation sites, active lines fills, and vacancy rates, 
and potential climate change risks, which includes data on extreme heat and flooding. <coughs> Next slide, please. There are four factors within the population characteristics and health vulnerabilities component score. Income, education, and employment, including information on low and moderate incomes, single parent households, and unemployment rate. Race, ethnicity, and language, which includes race and ethnicity data, as well as limited English proficiency data. Health impacts and sensitivities, including low birth weight and asthma emergency visits. Housing, energy, and communications, including renter occupied homes, energy poverty, and housing cost burden. <coughs> Excuse me. The Climate Justice Working Group consistently reiterated that income race and ethnicity were the most important factors in the DAC score. Income, race, and ethnicity are important for many reasons. The working groups lived experience in their communities and decades of social science research showing race, ethnicity, and income as being the biggest predictors of health and environmental disparities. To come up with a factor score, a weighted average is produced of all the indicators percentile ranks for each factor of a census tract. Next slide, please. <coughs> Before I continue, I want to note that we will have an opportunity to answer questions following the presentation. But if you have any questions at this time, please enter them into the chat function. There were multiple steps to arrive at the final DAC score. First, all the indicators are ranked into a percentile basis from 0 to 100. This was done to determine a census tract score relative to each other within the United New York State. Then a weighted average of indicators within their respective factors was calculated. <coughs> and then the weighted average of the factors within each component score was calculated. And finally, the two components are multiplied by one another to attain a single score for each census tract across New York State to determine if it isn't to be included in the geographic DAC criteria. Next slide, please. This slide shows the vis visual breakdown of the scoring approach I just described. As I mentioned previously, to come up with a score, a weighted average was produced of all the indicators percentile ranks for each factor of a census tract. Once the factor scores were calculated, those scores were added to one another to produce the score of the overall component, the long rectangular box there. The two component scores were then multiplied together to create a single score for each census tract. Please note that the climate change risk factor is the only factor with a two times weight so that that climate change is, equal to, is of equal importance to the other environmental factors within the environmental burdens component. Next slide, please. To ensure that an equitable distribution of DACs across the state, the Climate Justice Working Group decided upon using a combined scoring approach, calculating scores statewide or regionally. We created a New York State City rank and a rest of state rank. And then the top 27% of the scores statewide or regionally are designated as geographic DACs. <clears throat> this process ensures that non New York City census tracts were not left out of the geographic DAC criteria because of the high correlation of New York City census tracts have with many of the indicators used. Next slide, please. There's really no formula for the percentage of census tracts to identify as DACs. The Climate Justice Working Group considered the following factors in establishing this value. The CLCPA benefits of spending goal of 40% and targeting a threshold of less than 40% may encourage greater than proportional share of spending to benefit those DACs. <coughs> Ground truthing. Climate Justice Working Group spent considerable time 
looking at their communities and identified census tracts that should likely be DACs. A higher threshold, 40% or more, captured more of these ground truth tracts. But it also began to capture gentrified or gentrifying areas where not everyone needs as much support. Then room for review and expansion. The working group determined that it would be better to start with a smaller share of DACs and add rather than try to remove DACs. As a result of these considerations, the Climate Justice Working Group voted to designate 35% of census tracts as DACs. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the goal of the Climate Justice Working Group was to identify census tracts across New York State as DACs. The working group used a multi-step approach to do this, and this included using each census tract's overall score to calculate its percentile rack, rank statewide and regionally. <clears throat> the tracts that scored in the top 27% of their regional or statewide percentile rank were selected to achieve the overall goal of 35% of tracts designated. The percentile rank scoring threshold of 27 was determined to achieve that 35% designation threshold, considered all other rule, scoring rules. Automatically including 19 census tracts that were federally designated reservation territory or statewide state recognized nation owned lands. These were added <coughs> but we recognize that indigenous and tribal areas are sovereign territories and that as citizens or residents of those areas, nations have the right to determine the level of inclusion in this process. What we're looking at here is a recognition of the unique histories of racism and discrimination experienced by indigenous people, particularly in a colonial context. By including indigenous peoples in the DAC definition, we're establishing a baseline for inclusion should individual nations and tribal governments determine to engage in government to government consultation regarding this process. Finally, the designation of tracts with few census defined households or populations as DACs if their environmental burdens and climate risks are in the top 27% of their regional or statewide percentile racks rank. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this slide shows the percentage of geographic DACs across the designated regions in comparison to the general and low income population shares in the state. As you can see, using this methodology, most geographic DACs are in New York City across the five boroughs. The second highest percentage of DACs are in the Mid Hudson region. Next slide, please. In the process of determining a geographic criteria, the Climate Justice Working Group recognized that there are low income households across New York State that are not located within geographic DACs. This is primarily due to the fact that poverty in upstate and rural areas is more dispersed than in downstate. To address this, the working group elected to include low income households located anywhere in the state for the purpose of investing or directing clean energy programs. Next slide, please. <clears throat> to determine what was considered low income, the Climate Justice Working Group examined several options, including households with an annual income at or below 100% of the federal poverty level, 60% area median income, and moderate income households. From there, the Climate Justice Working Group determined that the inclusion of households at or below 60% of the state median income or households that qualified for low income energy program assistance would capture those households in need that fall outside of the geographic tax. The inclusion of low income households outside of the geographic tax only applies for purposes of allocating state clean energy and energy efficiency investments. And this slide shows the impact of in each region when the low income designation is added. 
The addition of this designation allows for an increase in the number of households considered under the DAC definition, particularly in rural areas of the state. Again, the designation of low income households is for the purpose of informing clean energy and energy efficiency benefits and, and investments only. And I'm now going to hand it back to Alana for a brief overview of the criteria. Thanks, Alex. The next, oh, no, it's already there. <laughs> so, as we stated earlier, the Climate Justice Working Group spent a significant amount of time developing the draft criteria and voted unanimously to release the draft criteria in December of 2021. The draft criteria includes 45 indicators in the criteria for environmental exposure and burdens and climate risks and socio yeah, sociodemographic and characteristics and health outcomes. The scoring methodology uh, is used for census tracts. So you see the second uh, thing they voted on was uh, the scoring methodology, which uses a multi-step uh, methodology that combines the selected indicators. They voted on the inclusion of 35% of New York State census tracts as geographic disadvantaged communities. They also voted on the inclusion of low income households located anywhere in the state for accounting for investments and benefits only. And they also voted on the definition for low income households as households with an annual income that is either at or below 60% of the state median income. And lastly, they voted to assure that they would come back annually to review the criteria and the indicators as recommended or not sorry as uh, required under the climate leadership and community protection act so just a reminder uh, we will have an opportunity to ask questions following the presentation but if you have any questions at this time please feel free to enter them into the chat function we also have lots of materials on our website, a summary document that provides a short overview of what we've covered today, uh, the full technical document that goes into great detail about every indicator, the methodology, the data used, and the indicators that were considered but ultimately not used. And finally, the interactive map where you can see the draft disadvantaged communities statewide. Uh, next slide, please. So here are those resources right here. I'm just going to let that sit on the screen just for a little while, just in case folks want to write anything down. And as you can see, uh, the, we have the website available, the uh, end date for the public comment period, and the US mail uh, address to send any comments, uh, comments that are uh, given during our public hearings uh, that come through mail or that come through our the website or through email are all given equal weight. Okay, and I will put this slide up again at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to Tyler Picard from NYSERDA to talk about the review of the disadvantaged communities maps. Uh, Tyler? Thanks, Alana. And if everyone bear with me momentarily while I pull up the map, um, it's great to be with you all today and thank you all for attending. My name is Tyler Picard and I'm a project manager with New York State's Energy Research and Development Authority's Energy and Climate Equity Team. I am here today to help walk you through the draft disadvantaged community criteria map. So to begin, you can access the map by going to the climate.ny.gov website 
and selecting the disadvantaged communities criteria box. Once there, you can select the interactive map hyperlink, which will take you directly to the map. So after loading the web page, you will be taken to the default draft disadvantaged communities map. On this web page, it shows the census tracts that meet the draft disadvantaged community criteria in New York State as shaded in purple. Before we jump into the details, a few notes on the map's functionality. So when users hover over the map, a toolbar will appear in the top left corner. Users can select the plus sign or the zoom in tool to zoom into the map. And please note it may take a second or two to update as there is a lot of data behind the map. Users can hit the minus sign to zoom out of the area as well. If users hover the right facing arrow here, you can select the zoom area tool. And by left clicking, sorry, bear with me one second. Doesn't want to grab the tool. There we go. By left clicking and dragging over an area, you can zoom directly into your selected area. By clicking that same right arrow, you can select the pan tool. And this will allow users to freely move around the map. Again, it does take a second or two to update. At any time, users can select the zoom home tool. And when you select this tool, it will take you back to the default page. One last note on the tools functionality. The magnifying glass above the toolbar allows users to search by zip code or city town place. So for example, if we type 12201 Albany County and select, it will take users directly to the zip code. And again, you can hit the home button to go back to the original position. So with functionality out of the way, I'm gonna spend a few minutes um, going over how to review the individual census tract information using the map. By simply hovering over a census tract, a pop-up box will appear that provides various information for the user. The first thing to note in the large bold text is whether a census tract is designated as a draft disadvantaged community or not. Another thing to note is the census tract's identification number is available at the start of this pop-up box. For our example here, you could see it starts with 360. Additionally, the city town place village name or um the city or town name is available if it is published in the u.s census so our example here it shows elba village it also shows the population of a census tract for our example 5330 at the end of the first um, portion there lastly it shows some summary information on the environmental burdens and population characteristics scores for the census tract. For this example, this census tract's environmental burden score is higher than 60% of census tracts across New York State. The population vulnerability score is higher than 50% of census tracts across New York State. Users can also left click on a census tract. And this will populate a table below the map. This table can be used to look at the individual indicators that make up the draft disadvantaged community score for the individual census tract. Please note that the indicators are sorted, sorted by their component with population characteristics and vulnerabilities on the left in blue 
and environmental burden and climate change risks on the right in orange. Additionally, the indicators are sorted by their factor. So for example, all health and impact burden indicators are in this section and all land use and historical discrimination indicators are in this section. Furthermore, they're sorted alphabetically within the factor. One last thing to note here, if you hover over any of the percentile scores, a pop-up box will appear. This pop-up box will give you a description of the indicator. I will note that our technical documentation on climate.ny.gov does give more in-depth information on the indicators um, if interested. One last thing to note, if we go to the top here, you'll see a select layer to display option. If the user clicks individual indicators, a drop down box will appear. Give it one second. There we go. This allows the user to select any of the indicators that went into the definition and populate the map according to that indicator. So, for example, if we choose burden traffic diesel trucks, one second, it will repopulate the map specifically to this indicator. And now the census tracts that are dark purple are the highest rankings for this indicator alone. I believe that's everything I have for the map. So with that, I would like to thank you all and turn it back to Alana. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Um, before we take a quick five minute break, I wanted to take a moment to uh, have folks look at the resources slide one more time. And uh, for anyone who's on the phone, I'm going to uh, read out some of the information. So for additional information on the disadvantaged communities criteria, including uh, looking at the comment form or the address to send comments, uh, please visit https colon forward slash forward slash climate dot ny dot gov forward slash our o u r dash climate dash act forward slash disadvantaged slash communities slash criteria. And if you're interested in sending us comments via US mail, uh, please send that to New York State DEC draft DAC comments, attention Office of Environmental Justice, 625 Broadway, 14th floor, Albany, New York, 12233. We are also accepting comments via email at DAC, DAC comments at DEC.ny.gov. And again, we'll put the slide up again at the end and I'll repeat this information. Uh, but right now we are going to take a, a quick five minute break and we'll be right back. So thank you. Next slide. All right, next one more. There we go.
Hi everyone, we're going to get started up again in just a couple of minutes, but I wanted to remind folks that if you have questions, um, you can raise your hands uh, when we come back for Q&A, or you can put all of your questions in the chat function. Uh, we'll get started again in about two minutes, so we'll be back at 6.52. Okay, it is now 652 and we are ready to start our Q and a and for that, I will pass this over to Adriana Espinosa, our deputy commissioner for equity and justice here at DEC. Uh, Adriana. I was talking on mute. Thank you, Alana. Uh, appreciate it. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. Great. Okay. So we'll take que questions now. Uh, if you're online, please, you can use the raise hand function um, and we can uh, put you in the queue to unmute you and you can ask your question live. If you're calling into the WebEx, please press star three to raise your hand. And if you would rather not ask your question out loud, that's perfectly fine. Uh, please feel free to use the chat function. And uh, just please remember that this is an education session and not a public hearing. Um, we, if you would like to make a public comment, uh, if you have um, you know, specific thoughts or suggestions about um, the criteria you heard, um, please submit those as public comments via our website, email, or US mail. All right, and now let's go uh, directly into the questions here. Okay, I have um, one question uh, that asked uh, if we could describe a census tract and where one can find a list of census tracts. And for that one, I'm going to tee up Alex to respond to. Alex? Uh, yeah, a census tract is a geographical kind of grouping that the United States government has overlaid. So what you actually have are these little basically kind of uh, territories around a geographic unit. And the smallest ones are um, census blocks, then they get added in together to be block groups, and then those get added to become a uh, census tract, and then those get you know compiled and compiled. 
and there was quite a bit of reasoning behind um, making sure that the data quality was good enough, which is why we chose census tract as the designation as opposed to block group. Um, <clears throat> so you can find, uh, let's see, I don't have the website off the top of my head, but you can find census tracts through the United States government um, website. And I'm census. trying to census.gov. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, and oh. I would just note that most census tracts have populations between 1,200 and 8,000 people. Thanks for that, Alex. Appreciate it. Okay, it looks like we have um, one more question here um, asking, can you please explain the reasoning for setting the disadvantaged communities threshold at a level such that 35% of census tracts are considered disadvantaged? Um, for that one, I'm going to uh, tee up Alana. Thank you, Adriana. So the climate justice working group members considered a combination of environmental and socio sociodemographic indicators uh, to develop the draft criteria, as we stated before. And in addition to that, the working group members uh, applied their own experience and understanding of community demographics and dynamics to the criteria. And the result of that assessment and all the deliberations um, was that 35% of census tracts would end up meeting the criteria. Um, so if there are any other considerations, I, you know, or you think that there were other ways that we, you know, other suggestions, I would definitely recommend you provide uh, that in comments uh, during the public process uh, to make sure that they are part of the record and so that the Climate Justice Working Group can consider that as part of their final decision. Thanks, Alana. Okay, so those are the only questions that I have seen um, in the chat. Um, it's possible that I, I missed it. Uh, while multitasking here, so if if I did miss it, please feel free to uh, to re up it for for us again. We want to make sure we answer all of the questions um, that you have about uh, the material we covered today. You can also use your uh, the raise hand function to ask a question out loud. Uh, still no questions in the chat that I'm seeing. I uh, don't see any uh, folks who raised their hand, but uh, we will hang out for a few minutes just to see if any questions come up or if someone is sort of typing out their questions. And uh, again, just to reiterate, and if you are on the phone and not on WebEx, um, you can still raise your hand. You just press star three on your phone. Uh, still seeing no other questions, uh, no hands raised so far. Again, there's a um, if, if you're on the WebEx app, on the it should be on the bottom of your screen. You'll see a, a hand like this. You click on that to raise your hand, and we can unmute you, and you can ask your question live. If you're on the phone, uh, you can press star three to raise your hand. There's also a phone number here on the screen. If you're having technical difficulties, uh, we're happy to help 
uh, help you work that out so that we can get your question answered. I'm also open, uh, you know, if, if you don't have a specific question, but you want uh, to suggest for us to go back to, to look at another slide again or another portion, we're happy to, to go back through the, the deck and show you um, one of those. It looks like we have a raised hand. And I will unmute Alexia, you are unmuted. Go ahead with your question, Alexia. Oh, great. Um, I just want to confirm that this is the same webinar pretty much as Wednesdays and they weren't uh, separate. The, the slides are pretty much the same in the content. Uh, yes, as the ed first education session that was, I believe, on the 13th. This Great, last the, week. Okay. the same presentation. Yep, same okay. content. Thank you. And will this Just recording... Different day, different time. Yep. <laughs> will this recording um, be accessible? Uh, yes. Uh, we're going to... I'm, I think we're going to post the recording for... Um, either this one or the one on the 13th on our website, and that'll be uh, available uh, for you. Uh, but again, they're, they're the same content. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks for your question. Any other questions or comments? And as a reminder, you can put your question into the chat. You can raise your hand by clicking on the hand button on the WebEx app or by pressing star three if you're on the phone. We may be uh, we may be done with with questions. Uh, here, seeing that there are no other folks raising their hands or nothing else in the chat, but we're still going to hang out for a few minutes uh, just to see if anything comes through to make sure that we can are providing uh, you know the information. Maybe for my uh, the folks on my team that are on the call before we call it for the evening, if we want to re up some of the the links that uh, we sent out, the links to to be able to leave a comment or to uh, view our materials or to view the map, we can put those in the chat. Thank you, Alana. Seeing the, uh, if you want to submit written comments to us in the mail, um, did provide the address there in the chat for you. You can also email comments to us at baccomments at dec.ny.gov. Oh, oh, and we're putting this up on the on the screen as well. Great. We're also putting links to our technical documentation, the map, um, lots of resources. Uh, we really want to hear from as many of you as possible to make sure that 
uh, we we got we got this right, and that we are um, you know accurately uh, capturing disadvantaged communities across the state uh, for purposes of implementing uh, the Climate Act. And just to reiterate one last time, um, the public comment period is open until July 7th, so you still have time. I uh, submit your comments by visiting the website on the screen uh, or, or in the chat uh, or email or US mail. And um, we will be holding public hearings on the draft criteria. Uh, this concludes our educational sessions on disadvantaged communities criteria, um, but uh, we'll be holding public hearings um, across the state and we'll have that information available uh, for you soon. And with that, seeing no other questions in the chat or no other raised hands, I think that we can call it. Thank you everyone for your time and participation. I hope that you provide us a public comment. Have a good night.